Thank you. So it's, uh, it's kind of awkward this, this time here. I know that some are off to, to watch the World Cup, but um, um, I must say that I got a, a great... Um, I had a number of talks this morning and uh, of course the, the keynote talk by Gene Myers introducing some of the, the issues that I, I take an interest here in, um, namely repeat sequences. And um, while next generation sequencing technologies offer unprecedented opportunities to assess variation in genomes, which is really the, the next step um, after you've uh, uh, successfully assembled your genome, um, they have certain limitations in regard to repetitive regions. Um, but with scale comes statistical power, and what I'll be presenting here today is, is really an embarrassingly simple method uh, which uses the scale of, of this high throughput data in order to make biologically meaningful calls in regard to a particular type of variation, namely repeat variation. Um, and we take a particular interest in a, in a certain type of repeat, namely short tandem repeats or microsatellites. There are many names for them. Um, these are a type of repeat which are uh, polymorphic, um, often unstable, and they underpin a number of different human neurological and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so um, we'd like to understand, we often make calls on variation on basis of a population of genomes. And these could be based on, well, the sources for this variation would be small scale um, or large scale. For instance, uh, structural mutations like those, those mentioned on this slide here. Um, these can be deleterious in nature for the function of the organism, uh, or they can be favored by natural selection. Um, so as I said on the previous slide, we're interested in short tandem repeats and this particular type of variation that we refer to as length variation. This could be expansion or contraction of, of repeat sequence. Um, now, if you're like me and interested in this particular type of, of um, sequence variation, um, you sh should pay careful attention to all stages of a sequencing pipeline, um, including those issues that were mentioned just in the previous talk by Gene Myers, um, because these repeats can collapse or be um, characterized poorly by various uh, stages in, a, in such a pipeline. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to come back to that at the end of the talk. Um, so first, what is the biological phenomenon that we're trying to understand? So this is a, um, just a toy DNA sequence where we've implanted uh, five repeats of a trinucleotide, namely CAG. Um, and these are sequences that are polymorphic, so they are amenable to change. And some of those changes occur during replication or DNA damage repair. Um, so uh, it might be that the DNA polymerase as it uh, reads off this uh, repetitive region, uh, slips and produces um, extra or multiple copies of that repeat unit. And of course, when that is then copied over in the second stage to the, um, the, the second strand, an expansion is realized. Now, it's also possible to get contraction, uh, but this is what we refer to as repeat length variation. Um, now, we're interested in saying something about what um, happens when we have repeat variation at the same locus uh, in multiple genomes. And we refer to that as variability. This is really an indication of abnormal variation across genomes at the same locus. And we hypothesize that this is related to the, uh, uh, the term genome instability which means high frequency of mutations within the genome of cellular lineage. And we know in many cases of cancers that we have an association with genome instability. Um, and this is the case also for a number of repeat instability disorders. Um, and I have a, a few of them mentioned on this slide here. So we're really interested in making a, um, an accurate assessment of the length of repetitive sequence, or these short tandem repeats. It's very important because we want to know when and how these, um, these sequences vary. Um, so for instance, um, here I've zoomed in on the, uh, the locus of uh, Huntington, or the, uh, the repeat sequence that is associated with Huntington's disease. So if you uh, read carefully here, 
you'll notice that there is a repetitive sequence. Again, this is the trinucleotide that I mentioned in the earlier example, CAG, that occurs multiple times. And there is an expansion that causes Huntington's disease. Um, now, this particular repeat occurs in an exonic region. This is no, by no way the, the only place in which these expansions occur. They do occur in non-coding regions as well. Uh, for some non-coding repeats, the, um, the resulting expansion can be quite excessive, whereas they typically stay within a, a reasonable limit in coding regions. So we want to know how these, these sequences vary and when they vary so that we can understand the causes of these diseases. Um, I don't need to dwell on this um, because it's been uh, talked about in the previous presentations today, um, but there are issues with um, mapping um, sequence data to a reference and if that is uh, to a, a repeat region. So this is just a toy example to, to demonstrate um, that there are multiple uh, positions at which this particular repeat can match uh, equally well. So as long as we um, have long enough reads so that we can encompass the repetitive region uh, so that there is uh, flanks on the reference sequence that will allow a, a confident alignment to occur, uh, we should be fine. Because if we look at that um, length on the reference uh, from the reference sequence point of view and compare that to our read length, we should see a difference if there is a, an insertion like here in the donor or the sample, or if there is a deletion like in this, this example here. The problem is, of course, if we have repetitive regions that are longer than our, our sequence reads, we will have problems with the alignment. Our simple solution to this, and um, we have a relatively novel but still very simple um, way of solving it um, is to use paired end sequence data um, where we have a fragment that can be much longer than your, your short sequence single reads and thus encompass the repetitive region. You can have the two reads mapped confidently to the flanks of the repetitive region. If we know the, uh, the fragment lengths, we should be able to make the same kind of assessment as we had previously and thus be able to see a difference between the sequence length uh, from the reference sequence point of view compared to uh, the fragment length. The problem is, of course, we don't know the fragment lengths. They can vary. Um, there are a number of experimental protocols. If you look in the Illumina um, protocols, you'll find some ways of constraining the fragment lengths, uh, including nebulization and hydrosharing and, and so on. So you could control the, uh, the variation um, or the deviation of fragment lengths to some extent. You can also sample your, your reads or your whole library and trust the, uh, the confident alignments in order to make an assessment of what your um, fragments are like. Uh, we are going to refer to Sorry, it's a bit difficult to read from, from the back of a room, I suppose. Uh, but um, mu L is the mean and mu L, squ uh, sorry, um, sigma L square is the variance of the fragment lengths in the, the library. So just to illustrate the point here, so if we assume that our, our uh, fragments are 500 base pairs long and there is some variation amongst them, uh, in this case 25, 50 and 10 Base, por, base pair um, deviation, standard deviation, um, we would prefer the latter scenario because that means that when we look at the length of our mapped sequence from the reference sequence point of view and see a difference, that needs to be explained in terms of changes in the fragment as opposed to um, the variability of the, the fragments in general. So, um, if we want to formalize this, how do we go about it? Um, so, consider a fragment of size L, where the two reads are not fully within the repeat region. And now we can talk about an observed sequence uh, from the reference sequence point of view, that is X. That is going to be the difference of that fragment length and the modification that has, um, it has been subjected to. Uh, this would uh, hold true for an insertion as for a deletion, same thing. Now we need to model the, the fragment lengths. Um, we need to consider multiple fragments where the two reads are not fully within the, rep the repeat region. 
Um, so we have a set of fragments X, which is uh, these guys here, and wish to estimate a delta, which is the, the number of repeat units that have been inserted or deleted uh, in the sample. Uh, we therefore uh, place a probability distribution on delta, given x, and we try to explain how a delta changes uh, with respect to x by using Bayes' rule. So there are two terms that I will refer to here. The first one is the probability of x given delta. That is going to be normal um, because we have only a linear shift in regards to uh, the, the change that has occurred to the fragment. And then the perhaps most interesting part of this is the prior of delta. Now we can just go ahead and assume that our change will be maybe normal, uh, centered on zero, um, but we can also use um, evidence from some independent method. There are a number of different variant callers out there that would be able to make an assessment of a variation on basis of other evidence, and we can incorporate that into our method naturally. Using some, some algebra, which we outline in the paper, um, we end up with a prediction. The actual prediction is to change the number of repeat units inserted or deleted and consists of a mean and a variance around that mean, which indicates the, the, the confidence that we have in that score. So that's the second part of this here. If that is low, we can simply ignore the prediction. And if it's high, we trust the prediction. It's interesting to note that with uh, sequence coverage or high sequence coverage, our confidence will, will uh, drive higher. And with uh, larger fragment size standard deviation, our confidence will go lower. Now, in the paper, we explain how, or we uh, outline quantitative results where we compare the results of our method of, as, um, against many other methods. Um, we do that on basis of simulated data where we take uh, the full genome of Arabidopsis thaliana. We inject variation so that we know where variation actually occurs. So we can assess things such as the, uh, the um, mean, root mean squared error of our predicted variation as opposed to that that has been injected in the, uh, the data set. We also do various uh, other accuracy metrics in the, the paper. I want to take away a couple of things from this slide here. And uh, for one, um, the blue line is the default method which uses in this case a fragment length of, oh, sorry, fragment length standard deviation of 20. Uh, but this holds true for all of the tests that we've done that the the uh, accuracy goes down with increased coverage, which is quite natural. The other two that go better are variants where we inject the predictions of alternative methods as a prior to our method. And more interesting is perhaps the, the experimental validation, uh, where we want to assess the ability to actually predict variation from this, the, the next-gen sequencing library. So we collect the paired and sequence data from the Wellcome Trust, 12 Arabidopsis thaliana strains. We um, made variation calls for 3,500 of uh, short tandem repeats. We amplified 60 randomly selected short tandem repeats um, and compared the fragment lengths with the reference strain Columbia. Um, using gel electrophoresis. So here we have uh, three gels uh, that are presented. Uh, what you see are the numbers that are the predicted um, changes to the, the different strains um, in each of the three cases. The first one is a representative or a stable collection um, where we don't see much of predicted changes and um, our validation shows that there is very little in terms of change amongst the strains. The second one here is where we see some major deletions, like this one here in the middle, which is predicted to have minus 45, so deletion of 45 repeat units. And um, quite correctly, it shows us a blot with a shorter sequence. And the third example here is where we have a mixture of insertions and deletions, which is also accurately reflected. So that is really an assessment of variation. Now, what we wanted to test was also our ability to predict variability. That is, um, 
that this is a locus that actually changes across many, many strains, or across a bigger population than the 12 strains that we've, uh, we had sequence data for. So what we did, we looked at 450 strains, and we looked at uh, five um, low, uh, low size that had um, high variability associated or predicted. Um, and we noted or confirmed that indeed over those 450 uh, strains that there was high variability. These are just two shown. Um, it's well known that unstable repeats um, or repeats are more unstable if they're pure, sequence pure, that there are no interruptions to the sequence composition. It's also known that the longer they are, the more, more amenable they are to change, the more polymorphic they are. Um, we looked at the correlation between our variability scores and those sequence features and found um, a significant correlation between both of them. Um, amongst the, the 10 most variable intronic repeats, um, we've uh, recovered the only known repeat expansion in Arabidopsis taliana. And this is a, a GAA repeat that occurs in the Burren strain in Arabidopsis. Um, it changes from 23 repeats up to over 400, so it's a fairly significant change, typical of intronic repeat expansions. Um, as a matter of fact, we looked at all our, our predicted variability scores across all short tandem repeats again, and labeled them with genomic region and were able to confirm, for instance, that intronic repeats are more variable than others. To summarize, um, we hypothesize that variation is, um, hypothesize that variation across the population indicates genomic instability. And this is really to get a handle on uh, what really interests us here, and that is to find the cause of these instabilities. Because replication, division, repair are fundamental processes that are associated with these repeat instabilities, but they're very common. Expand, uh, sorry, uh, repeat or short tandem repeats are also common, but expansions are not so. So um, there needs to be more context to these events, and we're trying now to, in our current research, to, to find the possible influence by using this particular method to make assessment about the variability. Um, just a, a few words about um, one of the two papers that this talk is really taking um, some material from. Um, we performed a, a much broader survey in regards to um, the assessment of um, short tandem repeat variation um, where we deal with single reads as opposed to paired end read um, technologies that the results that we saw were very different for different technologies um, including 454 ion torrent, pack bio uh, and Illumina paired end. Um, it depends a lot on what kind of alignment tool that you use. It depends a lot on what kind of variant caller you use. This is a survey that really sort of tries to survey what you can um, learn and about uh, experimental design before you set out to actually decide on which technology to use, what um, alignment tool to use and so on. The main message really from that survey is that to detect short tandem repeats at length of known repeat expansions and um, thus liable to instability, longer sequence read lengths and paired end sequences would be required which are fairly obvious conclusions, I guess. Um, these are the two papers that I've been referring to. So the first paper here is uh, documenting the, the simple method, the, the one that uses Bayesian analyses. Um, and the, the second one listed here is the, the survey paper. Um, I should uh, tell you that um, the, the main contributor behind this is my former postdoc, Mindu Kao. Uh, who's the first author on both of those two papers. And another major contributor is my collaborator, uh, Suresh Kumar Balasubramanian. And I'd like to uh, also acknowledge the funding from the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council. Thank you very much. Yes? Uh, 
Um, we know that that is, so we've um, experimented with this particular repeat and there are ways of actually uh, recovering um, the, the repeat um, expansion and that will uh, revert the, uh, the phenotype. So we know that that repeat expansion is responsible for this um, particular uh, formation of leaves in the barren strain. Um, so this, the, the repeat expansion itself will have um, uh, an influence on the expression of uh, a couple of genes um, and um, I how, how it works. yeah so the, the repeat expansion itself or the, the, the yes um, um, we think that this might interfere with um, transcriptional regulation. So this happens in an in a tronic region. Um, so there are at, at least suggestions of that being the case, but um, this is something that is still uh, ongoing. Um, thanks for the very informative talk. Um, I was interested uh, to hear whether you'd um, suggest that it could be used for a clinical diagnostic setting. For example, uh, I was going to look at um, SDR typing tools um, for the TrueSight 1 kit, which has um, two times 150 base pair reads. Yes. And there are several diseases which I hope will be able to be, can be typed like Huntingdon and some ataxias. Yes. Um, but others have an intermediate zone of maybe 200 to 400 um, trinucleotide repeats. Where would you see the uh, limit? Um. Well, um, th there would be practical limitations to, to use paired end sequencing, um, and with, with larger fragments, you will be uh, you will find it more difficult to constrain the, the the deviation in your fragment length. So I think that there would be an upper limit to how far you can you can go. Um, but I think in conjunction with other sequencing technologies, so we're I mean this is a, a tool that I think would have a complementary role to what we're seeing coming out now in terms of sort of long read sequencing technologies. Um, okay. So, um, but then again, I mean, most of the, um, so the phenotypic would repeat expansions would be in the order of a couple of hundred of base pairs, which would be perfectly fine to, to sort of um, characterize using this, this idea. Okay. Like um, so yes, we, we are looking into as well, Friedrich Ataxia, yeah. for instance, as yeah. one short yeah. tandem repeat. Um, expansion disorder yeah. where we think that this method might actually work. Okay, I'd like to um, drop your line then and stay yeah. in touch. Great, thanks. Yeah, I have a question for, uh, for Illumina sequencer. Uh, did you compare uh, what a different uh, can make for a different aligner? Um, you, I mean, the, which aligner works better for others? Um, so, if, if you look at the, the survey paper, uh, mm -hmm. I think that that could provide you with some information. In that, we look at um, 50 base pair reads uh, as well as 100 base pair reads um, with paired and with Illumina. And um, there, are, there are some differences, obviously. Um, so it all comes, I, yes, I, there is just too many things to sort of discuss in order to sort of say what the caveats of that analysis is. So I, I, I actually feel at best that you look at the paper. Okay. Yes. So another thing is like for the Illumina uh, sequencing, if the fragment's length is, uh, is not that long, basically is uh, shorter than the, the, the repeat, there's no way you can detect, use, use this program? Um, I agree. I'm not sure if I, if I understand the question. Um, so, so if the sequence uh, actually the fragment length yes. is shorter than the uh, repeat length, which, which could which could be the case. Yeah, right? yes. most of the case. I mean, yes. often yes. the case. Um, and and then I mean, you, this this method would would fail to okay. to some extent. Yes, I mean, it's not. It's not going to solve all, all problems. As, uh, when you go to, to longer repeats, it will, mm -hmm. you will fall into the same traps as, as single read technologies. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is, uh, what is the minimum coverage, like the sequencing depth, in order to achieve a reasonable accuracy? Um, and the second question is, uh, so it 
seems to me that the accuracy should depend on how accurately you can capture the fragment length distribution. And you're assuming a normal distribution. So in case that the fragment length distribution is deviated from normal distribution, yes, how yes, accurate yes. you can get so. Yes, no, good point. Um, the, f the first question, uh, so this is um, just a more extensive view on some of the, the tests that we did. Um, and um, we noticed that the, um, th there was some, um, we achieved the, the, well, close to the, the optimal results um, at about 50 or 60 um, um, read coverage. Um, so that's, that's, I think, is, and, and that goes, that holds true for all the tests that we did, actually. So this is using the, uh, the root mean squared error for the um, difference between the predicted uh, variation and the, the implanted one. Um, in the case of classification, it's much more difficult to see because it's a cruder measure. Um, but we think that um, going beyond 50 um, in, in depth would be sufficient in order to get reasonable performance. Um, second question, what, what, could you repeat it please? Uh, if, if the fragment distribution is deviated from normal. Oh yeah, yes, yes. Normal. So I'm not sure whether you saw one of the, the speakers this morning in this, this very room, he showed um, a distribution of the um, uh, fragment lengths, a typical fragment lengths um, for, for an assembly problem. And, and it, it is quite close to normal. Of course, there are difficulties associated with deployed genomes or, or um, uh, and um, there are going to be experimental difficulties in sort of filtering the, the, the fragments that have sort of uh, a particular um, fragment length. Um, but um, I know, for instance, some of the, the genomes that we've looked at have had a small standard deviation as seven, I think, was the smallest that we've seen. Um, but normally, would they, they would go up to 100 or even more. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need to take some, some care when you prepare your, your library. <laughs>